All right. It is now 6.30, and we will um, open the public session and start with actions taken in closed session to be read by Clerk Ms. Milchecker. Thank you. Um, first, um, on a 7 to 0 vote, the board voted to reject the appeal of discrimination complaint filed by a classified manager. And the second item I have to read out and the last one is on a 7 to 0 vote, the board rejected an extension of a previously board approved unpaid leave granted in June 2012 with benefits to a classified employee. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you. And please rise for our invocation to be led by Trustee David Lang. We give thanks for the many opportunities afforded us to contribute to society and help make this world a better place. We ask for blessings in helping us to make wise decisions that positively impact the community, our students, and the entire South Orange County Community College District network of individuals that we serve. We extend our wishes to all of the branches of the military, law enforcement, fire, and other men and women who protect us at home and abroad. Finally, we are grateful for the many freedoms we enjoy as Americans to live in the greatest democracy in the world with the hope that the many blessings we enjoy in our country will one day be extended to all those less fortunate than ourselves. Thank you. And remain standing. Trustee Milchaker will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag of our great nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And next on our agenda uh, is resolutions and commendations, and we have none. So we'll now move to public comments. Do we have anyone wishing to make public comments? No. Okay. So we will go to reports. We'll start with board reports and Trustee Jay. Thank you. Uh, before this meeting, uh, several of us were having a conversation uh, about the direction the district uh, took and came up in every single meeting up until the last uh, few months or possibly a year or two. And that was enrollment. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, get into that some uh, time. And uh, we'll ask uh, formally for an em enrollment uh, procedures and, uh, and uh, results uh, in the current situation. The current budgets, of course, are abysmal, as we all know. And uh, we'd like to see uh, just what uh, effect it will have on enrollments. Thank you. Okay, and Trustee Meldow. No report, thank you. Trustee Milchecker. Yes, first I attended a 9-11 ceremony at Saddleback College, and it was beautiful right by the Veterans Memorial, and it was uh, really well done, and I enjoyed it. Secondly, um, and, and finally, I just want to read a report about the Orange County Community College Legis Legislative Task Force, because this year it's begun a new work, a uh, year of ad advocacy work. And the task force is comprised of a trustee, chancellor, and public affairs director from each community college district in Orange County. And uh, I'm the, the community college uh, trustee from our district this year. And this year, our district is leading the Orange County Community College Legislative Task Force. So um, it's, it's a very exciting year for us. Uh, this year, we have chosen to continue our advocacy work on behalf of student veterans after last year's efforts yielded three new student veteran bill signed into law. And so this is a very successful year for the task force. Um, so all three bills, veterans bills that we worked so hard, this, that people in the district worked so hard on uh, were signed into law. They were AB 2478, which expands the current exemption given to veterans from paying non-resident tuition in California by one year. AB 2133, which extends the period of time that student veterans are able for priority registration from four to 15 years, and AB 2462, which will award credit to pri for prior military academic experience to our veterans. And this will uh, has to be approved in consultation um, and using core standards of the American Council on Education. So we'll continue to advocate for the Pell Grant programs, which you know is helping so many students in our colleges right now. 
And we plan to also work on items related to the college completion agenda, Title V changes, and recommendations of the Student Success Task Force as needed this, this year. So we're looking for a very exciting year. And, and I thank everyone for helping on getting these bills passed. It was a, certainly a, an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Um, and now Trustee Pendergast. Yes, uh, I too was able to attend the September 11th ceremony, but at uh, IVC, as usual, it was very well uh, coordinated and, and attended. Uh, one of the things I, I inadvertently took away from that was overhearing that the parking situation was uh, less than desired and the fact that we have so many students not dropping classes, um, which I guess is a good thing in the sense that we have a high demand, but uh, uh, was unexpected, and so so we'll take away from that what we can. Uh, and just today, I was able to do a district services tour. Um, it's very enlightening, and you know, just because of the geek side of me, I really enjoyed the hearts and brains of the IT department. That was really neat going in there. So thank you, Dr. Bermucci. That was my favorite. Not that others were not important, but. <laughs> um, and then I'm looking forward to the uh, homecoming game this this Saturday. Okay, thank you. And um, I also was able to attend the 9-11 ceremony at IVC and would have loved to go to Saddlebacks, but what could I do? They were both scheduled at the same time. So hopefully we'll correct that in the future. <laughs> so, um, And I have been to, of course, a couple of football games, and we'll be enjoying the homecoming game coming up soon this Saturday, right? So... Um, and did the district tour with Trustee Pendergast and was very impressed. And there's a lot to digest. So um, I remember way back when, when our IT department was in a trailer with the floor falling apart. <laughs> so we've come a long way and uh, well deserved. Um, so we will now move to Trustee uh, Wright. Thank you. I too was able to go to the 9 11. Uh, commemoration, uh, received a nice uh, copy of the Irvine World News, which describes it. It was at IVC. That was the first invitation. I, I received that invitation first, so <laughs> I went to IVC. I've been to Saddlebacks <laughs> many, many times. But, again, they were at the same time. Right. Uh, on Friday, uh, September the 14th, uh, I was privileged to go to a science lecture series in the morning at Saddleback College. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it, uh, I was touched because it actually was in my memory. So uh, they had an, uh, an organic chemist from uh, IVC or from UCI that uh, was the speaker, and she did a wonderful job. Went to the football game on uh, September the fifteenth. Uh, we played Riverside College. Saddleback did. It didn't do very well, but <laughs> hopefully we'll do much better this Saturday. Uh, I actually toured for a second time the Library and Learning Resource Center and had a meeting with uh, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, which I very much enjoyed. I was very impressed because uh, there were a lot of computers on the third floor, and they were almost all being used. And I went through the other parts of the, of the Learning Resource Center, and it was being used. And I thought that was wonderful that uh, it was being used. And uh, it's a beautiful building, and it, uh, I'm glad it's being used. I also went over to the Science Math Building, and they have a student lounge there, and it, too, was being used. So we're finding that students like to study together. They like to have areas, and they like to have places where they can go and study. Uh, on Friday, uh, last Friday, I attended the uh, memorial service for Professor Daryl Dieter, who passed away on the 7th of uh, September. He was an absolutely superb instructor. Here's a copy of, of his memorial service. Uh, a wonderful instructor, lots of compassion, lots of wonderful things said about him at this memorial service. And uh, he, he will be missed. And it will be very difficult to replace him. Uh, finally, uh, I'm looking forward to the homecoming game and the festivities this Saturday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trustee Lang. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was also privileged to attend IVC's uh, 11th annual September 11th uh, commemoration uh, service at the Performing Arts Center and uh, really want to extend my appreciation and congratulations to President Rockmore 
uh, and uh, the MC, uh, Police Chief Will Glenn, and also um, really want to acknowledge the uh, presenters that have been there for a number of years now, uh, Police Chief uh, David Maggart, Fire Authority Chief uh, Keith Richter, and Orange County Sheriff uh, Sandra Hutchins for their moving remarks. It's really special to have them there, I think. Uh, board President Nancy Padbrook certainly did an able job in representing um, our, this board in our district uh, as well. And I think it's just important that we not forget the significant time in our country's history, both the tragic loss of life and I think also a new dedication and resolve to uh, pursuing the path of justice and determination to combat radical terrorism. Uh, last week I attended a UCI Chancellor's Club event that described the UCI STEM initiative um, where they're dedicating resources to teacher training for the science, uh, sciences, uh, technology, education, and math to enable students to both attain a degree in uh, the teaching field as well as a credential in one of these specialized fields as well. Um, as the studies have shown, uh, the rankings of the U.S. compared to other countries, in the, particularly in the math and sciences, um, has steadily decreased. Um, I, I'm also pleased that IBC has uh, this initiative identified for the ATEP site as well. Um, finally, um, well, I also want to uh, thank all of the district services folks uh, that participated in uh, providing uh, uh, trustee pad Trustee Padberg, Sir Prendergast, and myself, really a wonderful tour of the whole facilities. Yes, the IT was certainly special, but everybody really did a terrific job uh, in terms of describing what they do and uh, giving us a, a better level of appreciation. There were things that, you know, I've been on the board for 16 years now, and uh, there were things that I, I wasn't aware of or hadn't seen before, so it was, it was very nice. Uh, finally, um, I wanted to at least make reference to the recent uh, unrest abroad in Libya, Egypt, and the other countries, which may or may not have been triggered by the insulting and juvenile video um, and um, should provoke us, I think, to more deeply explore the appropriate balance between preserving our First Amendment rights and curtailing hate speech and anti-defamation acts that incite violence. Some of the election season sound bites, frankly, I don't believe have been very helpful in this regard in advancing this dialogue, and uh, I think it's a discussion worth having, in my opinion, particularly on an academic campus. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Park. Um, I was able to attend IVC's um, student government meeting this week, and I watched a lot of the new senators and commissioners get ratified. Um, Pol Chief of Police Will Glenn also attended and was able to extend his welcome to the new senators and commissioners. Um, I was also able to attend IVC's club day, which was really good. A lot of clubs came out and um, recruited for their clubs. All right, and our chancellor's report. Um, my, my comment uh, is, uh, is that I want to thank the faculty of our district uh, for uh, the presentations that they're, be that they're beginning tonight and they'll be making through the remainder of the year and uh, regarding the Student Success Task Force, um, task force as it relates to the college completion agenda. This is extremely important work for our district and will be for years to come. And I'm pleased that they've been so, faculty been so willing to come forward and participate in this for the remainder of this year. All right, thank you. And we are now at um, the next item, which is board requests for reports. Do I have any requests for uh, reports from board members? I think I had oh, you had. Okay, it's on the agenda. I didn't see your name. And it, it is um, actually where? Uh, okay, it is on the agenda. So we now need to have a motion to accept this request for report. So moved. so moved by Trustee Pendergast. Okay, thank you. And seconded by Trustee Wright. So let's all vote on this request for report. It didn't work. Uh, we don't have our names on our vote screen. Could we fix that? Okay, till they get the technology fixed, let's just vote by um, orally. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right. We will bring that report back. Thank you. And at this point, we are at um, our discussion items. And we're going to advance 4.2 ahead of 4.1 because one of the presenters has a class to attend, I believe. So that is Saddleback and Irvine Valley College Completion Agenda. And we'll ask each presenter to please introduce themselves and tell us what college they're from. I'm Bob Cosgrove, Saddleback College, Kathy Schmeidler, IVC College, uh, both Senate presidents, as you know, and we are here to embrace what the Chancellor said. Thank you very much for the remarks. And to, again, recognize that the faculty is essentially the driving force on student success and preparation. And as Chancellor uh, <clears throat> Portner has said, without the faculty, it's not going to succeed. And I've been kicking a lot of fake faculty at uh, Saddleback to get them moving. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we have uh, uh, four presenters uh, this evening, and um, we're dealing with Recommendation 1, which uh, partly encompasses uh, looking at the community college, Saddleback and Irvine Valley, looking at their high schools and middle schools and making connections and links to strengthen the core of courses that are offered at the high schools so that students are better prepared when they come to uh, the college. Uh, and then, of course, we have the other direction uh, with the link of uh, universities and our community college uh, district. Uh, the two presenters from Saddleback are um, Renee Bangater and Don Lewis. And I'll let Kathy introduce the other two. Are you the two? <laughs> <laughs> the, as, as we mathematicians say, the other two. <laughs> Um, our Karim, Dean Karima Feltus, Dean of Liberal Arts. Thank you. Her name, her title, her name hasn't changed so recently, but her title changed. Um, Brenda Boran, Professor of English, right? And Jonathan Alexander, and he's a professor from UCI. So that obviously makes the connection to the university. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Renee Bangeter. I'm a professor of English at Saddleback College, and this is my colleague Don Lewis, who is from Elisa Niguel High School, but just this fall has joined us at Saddleback in our English department as well. We are the co-chairs of the English Professional Learning Council, which is uh, part of the intersegmental uh, project that both of our schools are working on. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the work that we have been doing over the past two years that we're really excited about. And uh, the uh, English Professional Learning Council started at Saddleback um, in the fall of 2011. And our college created two councils, one in math, one in English. Uh, unfortunately, only the English is um, still intact this year. And these groups worked in collaboration, which was then, what was then called CalPASS and is now the Institute for Evidence-Based Change, who could statistically track our students' success rates as they move from high school to Saddleback and then ultimately to their transfer institutions. And the goal of these intersegmental groups is to align curriculum among the local area high schools, Saddleback College, and the transfer uh, institutions such as UCI and Cal State Fullerton. And we've had representation from both of those institutions on our council. And really to increase transfer and success rates. As the recommendation shows, 70 90% of students come to community colleges in California um, unprepared. And then uh, ultimately only a quarter of our students uh, become successful in their college career goals. And so our uh, objective and everything that our council does is to address those specific issues. So Dawn's going to tell us uh, who joined us. Just a little bit about me. I've taught in the Capistrano Unified School District for 20 years. And um, after being in the council for the last year, I was like, what a great place. 
What a great place. I, I want to be here. I've sent students here for 20 years. I know half the people on the campus walking around. And after just meet, working with the faculty and, and different administration, I was like, I want to be here, so I'm here. And, and so it's really super fun. I'm part-time, I'm part-time high school and I'm part-time college, and I'm having a blast. How our um, PLC came about was we, we just kind of, Cal Pass kind of hit it off with Saddleback, and whoever came, came. And they said, who wants to chair this? And we're like, we do. And so they kind of wanted a high school secondary representative and a post-secondary. So Renee and I said, here we go. And we're, we're so thrilled. And first meeting was mostly Saddleback and some Capistrano. And we're like, hmm, we need, we need more people here because there's, there's more students coming here. They're just not from Capistrano. So then we got our Saddleback Valley partners, a little bit slower to come, but we're still working on Saddleback Valley. We got Laguna Beach. So we have our like kind of three, three key districts and we're excited about that, hoping to expand and get some high school teachers from Laguna Beach. We're missing that component. And then we also got Cal State Fullerton, UCI, um, and some other colleges and just were thrilled to have a broader representation of South County. And we also then got the Orange County District of Education, uh, Department of Education, and um, we got people in different departments from the Department of Education, which was great, and someone really strong, kind of the lead person in Common Core. And so we great, great representation, really excited about this year. So um, in May of 2010, long before the student success recommendations came down the pike, uh, we met to plan our basic skills initiative project for 2011 with the goal of identifying curriculum gaps um, and specifically from the high school to the community college. Our English uh, faculty had already revamped English 1A to better align with the uh, transfer institutions, so we turned our direction um, the opposite way to look at what we could do on the high schools. And we learned that with the implementation of the Common Core uh, in 2014, that was much more in line with the things that we were teaching in our English classes. And the uh, members of our committee were really excited to start teaching to those standards, and they said, but we have no materials to do so. Our textbooks all te uh, are literature-based, and yet we uh, do more informative text and expository type of writing. So we created um, some materials to fill that gap, which we'll tell you a little bit about. And the goal uh, um, was to increase that career readiness. We actually want students coming to Saddleback enrolling in English 1A, the transfer level course. And then for those students that are already here, we wanted to um, help them be more successful. So we'll tell you a little bit about um, some of the projects that we've done. Our first project was to create some, we want to use technology, and we know that that's the greatest way to reach most people. So we created some tutorials. We were real ambitious and thought we could do writing, grammar, reading, and realize maybe overambitious, which is typical of educators. So we um, have some uh, videos. We have five, write, five or four writing videos and five or four grammar videos. These can help kind of everybody. They can help the high school student um, study for the matriculation test. They can help the, um, the high school teacher. It can help the Saddleback student or the college student and help the college teacher. So anyone can access this. They're going to they're gonna find a home on the web soon that hopefully people can find because that sometimes can be a problem. And so that's where we are right now with that is finding a home for these about approximately four-minute, five-minute tutorials. That was our first part of our project. And then this year, uh, we became even more ambitious. You can tell that that's a problem with us. Uh, and um, we're really excited to specifically share with you what um, has developed for this year's project. Um, so we uh, decided that we would work from the Common Core Standards and create a common writing assessment and uh, rubric that we could then go out to the different colleges and norm the faculty. Because as I sat around the room, I noticed, while wow, we have about 15 or so teachers, what can we do to have a greater impact? And I felt that the, the best thing that we could do when we all got on board with this was to actually go out physically to the high schools and take our, our writing assignment that all of these teachers had worked so hard on and these rubrics 
to um, norm their faculty, train them so that we could be in alignment in terms of our rigor and expectations um, for those, those written assignments. Unfortunately, as our vision grew, uh, our, our funding was initially cut. Now, normally that would be a, a big problem. It actually ended up being quite serendipitous, and that's what we're excited to share with you tonight. I immediately turned to an outside vendor that I have relationships with, and uh, they offered to pay our teachers to work over the summer. We knew that the only way we could get teachers to work in the summer was if we paid them. <laughs> so uh, they uh, agreed to uh, pay us so that we could get a jump start on our project because we, we were starting off the 2011 year with an 80% cut, um, which is no longer the case, but um, we also ended up with some, some great results on that. I'm going to let Dawn give you a little bit of background on that project. So this summer, some of the council met and we, cre we looked at the Common Core Standards, which have been adopted by almost every state. Texas always has to do its own thing. Um, no mention, you know, other states. But uh, Alaska, I don't know what they're doing over there. But um, so almost every state has adopted these national standards. We're excited about that. And so we looked at those standards for writing, and we developed um, rubrics for grades 9 and 10, and then grades 11, 12, so a rubric for each in the areas of argumentative writing, informative writing, and narrative writing. And now they are going nationwide and available to pretty much almost every educator and student as well. And we're just thrilled, thrilled about that. And I think Renee is going to mention a little bit more, a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I'm going to let Dawn uh, be in charge of passing the rubrics. We brought those for you. So as I mentioned, our goal this year was to share uh, our work that we were doing at Saddleback um, with more teachers. And we had no idea that our goal would actually, to quote, go um, to infinity and beyond. Our vision was to reach out to the high school teachers um, locally, but this partnership with Turnitin actually took our work nationwide. The Common Core Standard rubrics will now be implemented in every high school and every community college in the United States who is part of the Turnitin system. And since you're probably not familiar with Turnitin, I brought the screenshot of their website. Um, 20 million papers have been graded through Turnitin so far. Uh, just to give you perspective, 200,000 papers are uploaded to Turnitin daily, and all of these uh, papers will potentially, at the high school and community college level, be able to be graded from these rubrics. When teachers download them, it has the um, Turnitin logo, the IBC, IEBC, the Institute of Evidence-Based Change, and Saddleback College logo on those um, rubrics. Uh, Turnitin has 75% of the market share in higher education and 35% of the market share in uh, secondary education. And while it is a global um, company, obviously the Common Core Standard only has traction here in um, the United States, but we're really excited to know that um, we will be going beyond just our local high schools and to high schools across the nation. And uh, I also brought with you the screenshot of the rubrics as they are already available in the Turnitin system. So teachers are already using them to score and grade papers. Uh, I, the, you have the print versions then. I'll get them to you. And our impact has far exceeded our vision. Um, and uh, we have national traction. We've offered webinars, uh, three webinars with approximately 500 attendees. Uh, across the United States who are interested in our project. We had so much interest from these webinars that we created a Google group that we manage uh, to continue those conversations. And um, we are happy to share and talk more about this. So Don's going to share some other news. And I'll get you, make sure you get, you should have two packets, and I know I didn't, math, I'm, I'm English teacher, so math isn't great, but I'll, get, I'll make sure you get your packets. Um, so coming up in April, we're going to go to the National School Board Association, Renee and I, and um, the conference meeting in San Diego, and we're going to be able to present what we've done here in South Orange County and how you can get teachers dialoguing and intersegmental groups and how you can build a relationship. You can come up with terminology that's the same so that when students go from one institution to another, we're talking about the same thing. We have the same standards. An A is an A here and an A is an A here. And we know, understand the matriculation test. We understand 
the problem with remediation and it's and it's so it's so it's very it's been very humbling as the the teacher who's sending all of her students here who are being remediated and so i have to what what am what am i not doing what am i doing wrong and what can we do better and it's such a great discussion and we're so excited about last year and this year and really thankful for the opportunity to do that thank you thank you very much And this will be IVC now. Good evening, um, Board of Trustees. Good evening, uh, our district members and guests. Uh, my name again is Karima Feldes, and I have with me Brenda Boron, the English, uh, the English professor. She's an English professor at IVC, but she's known as Brenda. And we have Jonathan, who's Jonathan Alexander, who's the writing, who's the campus writing director at UCI. And we will make our presentation brief. We were told to keep it to seven minutes. Uh, we're very impressed with our sister college, uh, Saddleback uh, College, with what they're doing. So uh, we'll try not to uh, repeat some of the information that you just heard. Uh, let me remind you that in August, uh, the, op the Chancellor's opening uh, session covered some of this. Uh, most of you, I think, attended that uh, Chancellor's opening session. Brenda and Jonathan gave a presentation in detail, so we will not try to repeat that tonight. What we will do instead is go over the comments from the colleagues who attended the workshops. Um, and please feel free to ask any questions uh, during the presentation or after. Um, I, I'd like also to share with you, and I'm of course her dean, and I'm very proud of what Brenda does. Um, I'm sure uh, your dean is proud of you as well, Jonathan. But <laughs> I can't tell you how excellent Brenda is, what she's done for the students and for the college over the years. In fact, this recommendation, um, we're dealing with recommendation one that just came up January of 2012. Brenda has been doing that work since April of 2009. So we were already three years approximately ahead of the curve. So that says it all. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and just remind you of what recommendation one is. The Student Success Task Force recommendations call for collaboration with higher education and K through 12 partners to define standards for, the, for college and career readiness and communicate them to students in the K through 12 assessment process. Several of our uh, community college participants had numerous comments about uh, the various programs that we've put on. Uh, Brenda and I have tried to gather a number of different folks together from both Irvine Valley and from Saddleback so that we can talk with professors of English uh, from your colleges, uh, with professors of English from my uh, campus, and so we can share some ideas about what are the best ways that we can facilitate transfer uh, of your students to the to the UCI campus. Uh, these comments have been pretty much uniformly enthusiastic uh, in terms of talking about things that people have learned. For instance, Rebecca Rudd uh, from Citrus College, a little bit north of here, says that the discussions helped increase her understanding of the expectations for transfer students, but also provided a good context in which to discuss some practices that may not be as productive in preparing students for success after transfer. Art Marina Anime, uh, Amini from Saddleback College went on to say that the presentation as a whole had a very nice tone to it, uh, and I, I found that to be particularly important. Uh, you know, we did not want any of our collaborative exercises to, to in any way be confrontational, but instead to be extraordinarily collaborative, and they have been. Marina said that there was a spirit of collaboration and collegiality and not one of blame and finger pointing. I appreciated this, she said, and I know many members of our school did so as well. And finally, Jaya Dubai from IVC said that she was very excited for future sessions. Quote, it gave us all a big picture view of where our students will go, how they'll be assessed, 
and how we can best help them move forward. It was very rewarding, and she thanked us for all of our fine work and dedication. And Celeste Hines, who's an adjunct faculty member at our college, said, I appreciated the conversational yet focused nature of the presentations, and I feel that this attitude carried over into the small group discussions. I was able to share some of the ideas I was exposed to in the Basic Skills Institute, for example, team teaching, designated an ESL academic um, English section of developmental writing, and learning from my English colleagues. And Bill Etter said, these workshops were extremely useful for fostering lines of communication between UCI and IVC, as well as other community colleges who sent representatives. It also fostered collegiality amongst all these groups. I learned a number of things about UCI's present and future expectations that I will pass along, particularly to my Writing two students at the end of this semester so that they will better be, be better informed as well. Continuing with the comments, um, those comments from high school, or a sample of comments from high school participants. Um, to, as an answer to the question, what did you find most helpful today and why, um, the answers were under, understanding the expectations at the college level, dialogue with peers, discussion with whole group, transparency, clarifying my perception of the demands at different high schools and at IVC and UCI. Another comment goes, it was great to see your rubrics because they match well with our rubrics. Vertical articulation, specifically college expectations. Um, more answers to the same question. The IVC and UCI writing requirements and assessments because it helps me reflect on my teaching. Professors from IVC and UCI sharing writing expectations. I felt affirmed in how we assess writing. Discussion with group to address common writing concerns. Dialogue, connecting, sharing perspectives. We are doing what we are supposed to do. We asked several people to comment about the overall perception of the writing program at IVC in particular. And they said several things, such as uh, the program seemed very planned and very thorough clearly trying to meet the needs of specific students upon entrance. Uh, they seem to be very, pers very personal and meaningful. The writing conferences for the students seemed fabulous. Uh, they commented about the very good preparation that the students had uh, get at IVC for transfer into four-year programs and that they were generally impressed and that they wished that they themselves had resources to emulate some of the features of that model. Um, they also seemed very appropriate, strong, and solid. Things, uh, the programs focused on what they themselves as high school teachers needed to be focusing on. Uh, my favorite comment, uh, much more solid than I anticipated. Uh, so, but of course they are. It's act they were excellent, in fact, unified, clear, challenging, and rigorous. And finally, we asked them, um, what would you like to tell us or what would you like us to understand about you and the constraints under which you work? And I'm familiar with some of those constraints, though not certainly not the kinds of constraints that K through 12 teachers have now, because I taught at Saddleback High School for nine years. And before that, I taught in junior high and high school in Texas. So these are the things that our colleagues from the high schools told us. The cognitive ability of our students does not match with the academic standards for their grade level. I think you already get it. That's why conversation with you was so healthy and rich. You already seem to understand the students and our constraints. We have a lot of students and try to keep a sense of uniform experience for them all. This consistency is improving. I think we will be transitioning into more processed pieces. Uh, we found out that much of the writing that was done in high school, especially in Irvine High School, uh, unified high schools, was on demand or timed writing done in class. So um, this is a, a response to that. I hope this better prepares our students for college. We want you to understand that we want to do well and will respond to information. 
we want you to understand that we have little time to squeeze in any additional assessment. That the quantity of students limits what we do. We have huge numbers. And that there's too much to teach, not enough time, and too many kids. Before we move on to move on to the end of the presentation, as next steps, I'd like to remind uh, board members that we have three folders in front of you. The red folder has the August presentation uh, that uh, Jonathan and Brenda gave at the Chancellor's opening session. Tonight's presentation is in the blue folder, and the navy folder contains an iJournal article that Brenda and Jonathan co-authored. Uh, and it's uh, about the articulation between K through 12 and higher education. Thank you. So over the last several years, uh, Brenda and I have been gathering people together primarily to talk. Uh, one of the principal uh, issues that I'm facing is how do I assess the efficacy of this work? Because it's a lot of talk, and we hear very good comments uh, from our participants about what they're learning, how they're learning it, uh, but we need to track a little bit better about what they're taking back to their home campuses, to their classrooms, and what they're doing. So we're going to launch an assessment survey uh, within the next year to try to actually capture some concrete qualitative data about what kinds of actual transformations people are making, either in the classroom curricula or in large curricula and departmental level curricula. And we hope to be reporting on that data within a year's time. In the meantime, there are several programs that we're going to continue. Uh, Brenda and I are working on an AWPE scoring workshop for high school teachers. The AWPE is the Analytical Writing Placement Exam. It is one of the principal exams or measures through which we at the University of California assess students' writing ability and place them uh, in appropriate courses within the University of California. About 14,000 students take this test across California annually. Uh, it's important that our high school teachers know how best to prepare students to take that particular exam. Uh, but this exam also serves, as I think, as a good, good rubric for uh, creating pedagogies uh, around writing instruction. Uh, we're also going to host uh, an upper division scoring workshop for community college teachers. Uh, I oversee the upper division writing courses at UCI in which students are asked to write in the disciplines. It's important that our community college partners know what kinds of writing students are expected to do once they come to my campus and how they can best prepare students for that transfer. For the third year in a row, we hope to plan an institute, uh, a summer institute on the teaching of writing. Uh, we've had about 30 participants each summer so far from all over the community colleges in Southern California uh, who come to us to learn about some of the best practices and innovations in the teaching of writing. There are numerous people that we would like to thank, including Vice President Craig Justice, President Glenn Rockmore, Dean Kathy Worley, and my Dean, Sharon Salinger at UCI, for their continued support of these programs. And let me just say that I've been working in higher education, well, actually as a literacy educator for 20 years. I've worked in high schools, in community colleges, in regional campuses, and now at an elite institution. And in those two decades of work, Working with your faculty at IVC and Saddleback is hands down the single most important work I think I've done in my career. You should be extraordinarily proud of the people you have working for you. They do a tremendous job. Thank you. All right, thank you. We will move on to the next uh, discussion item is 4.1, District-Wide Strategic Plan, and this will be presented by Denise Inseong. Sorry, did I say that right? <laughs> you did. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can get my... Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Denise Ensiang. I'm the District Research and Planning and Data Management Director. And I'm going to be presenting you our district-wide strategic plan 1114 annual progress report. 
you have in your packets a report that has this cover. It's the landscape cover. Um, what I'm going to be presenting is a high-level summary. I'm going to take you back up now that you've seen these wonderful detailed presentations. I'm going to give you a high-level presentation on a strategic plan. And um, in your agenda is also an 80-page document that has a lot of detail in there. But I'm going to try to summarize it for you tonight. So to refresh your memory, this is our first year of implementation of our first ever district-wide strategic plan. In um, the summer of this summer in May, on May 30th, um, the district-wide planning council met to review, evaluate, and document the progress of the strategic plan. In the strategic plan, there are six major goals, 14 objectives, and 76 action steps. In this first year, four of the 14 objectives have been completed, which is approximately 30%. 36 of the 76 action steps have been completed or are near completion, which is about 47% of our action steps in the first year. In the next six slides, what I'll do is go through each of our major goals, um, give you a brief summary of what the goals contain um, and the objectives and action steps, talk about the accomplishments, and, and then what we're focusing on this academic year. In goal one, um, our district will create a district-wide culture, <coughs> excuse me, which is characterized by mutual respect and collaboration and celebrates the uniqueness of each institution. In this goal, the objectives and action steps are around identifying barriers to collaboration, uh, developing a policy on mutual respect, a climate survey, and the chancellor's communication with um, all employees. This year, the presidents, together with the chancellor, um, identified five top barriers to collaboration and communication uh, and cooperation and um, have developed uh, strategies to address these barriers. There's also been a board policy that's been drafted, and this will be reviewed at the colleges. And the chancellor has made um, efforts to communicate with all employees through the prospective newsletter, college-wide forums, and a monthly board um, meeting highlight newsletter, to, to name a few of the, the efforts. This year, we'll focus on addressing these barriers um, across the district. That work will continue. And we'll also be assessing some of this progress in a climate survey, which I'll tell you about uh, in, another, in the coming, upcoming goals. In goal two, um, this goal is all about improving student preparedness and success. Um, what you heard tonight in, in IVC's and Saddleback's example is, is one of the multitude uh, or two of the great, <laughs> two of the great uh, programs that are happening at the campus. So in this goal, the chancellor um, has talked a great deal about increasing completion rates for degrees, certificates, and transfers. Um, this looks at developing an avenue for professional development um, and looking at identifying supporting best practices and innovation. So we found out that there's so much going on when we reviewed this goal that, um, like you see, you're going to have a series of presentations around this, this topic, that the district-wide planning council felt will focus on coordination of this work so we can continue to communicate that, and that's what's going to be the focus of this year. In goal three, um, the district will maintain its technology, technological leadership and make future advancements which enhance student access and success. This goal is about creating the first district-wide technology plan um, and determining uh, the components and responsibilities for this plan. So as far as the accomplishments, this plan was completed. It was also utilized to support requests for basic aid technology funding, which was used in our newly BARC process. Upon review um, at our retreat, the council felt that um, further review of this process is necessary and, and the appropriate councils or committees will be looking at that. And a companion district-wide information technology operations plan will also be developed this year. In goal four, um, we're looking at increased increasing the effective use of all resources by developing and implementing a cycle of integrated district-wide planning. This goal and all the objectives um, in this goal is all about planning um, and long and short-term planning, district services, administrative unit reviews, and resource allocation. 
So in the accomplishments, what you'll see in, in all of these bullet points are firsts. There's a lot of firsts that have happened. It was the establishment of the district-wide planning council, a first shared governance council district-wide, the first um, completed district-wide planning and decision-making manual, um, the first district services administrative unit reviews were also completed, um, the update of our multi-volume educational facilities master plan and district-wide function map, and and a newly a newly created draft of a district-wide budget and planning handbook. So a lot of planning efforts um, were uh, accomplished in this last year. So what we'll focus on is to con continue to update these documents and review our, our processes in utilizing these, these processes and documents. Goal five is all around district-wide um, decision making using data. And I think what you'll see here in this goal is around the climate survey. Because we have all of these new processes for planning and resource allocation, we needed to assess how that processes um, are occurring. So this past year, the research and planning offices um, piloted climate questions in their employee surveys. And we're utilizing those results to develop um, an it will be biannual climate, uh, district-wide climate survey. So that will be happening this fall. Um, we anticipate in October that will go out to all employees. And in the spring, we'll analyze those results. And, and the last goal, which is goal six, is um, we will assess the educational needs of the communities um, within the district boundaries and pursue joint venture partnerships with educational institution and business industries. So this goal um, is a lot of the objectives and action steps are around ATEP, developing a three to five year site plan, um, the college service areas, as well as um, an external or environmental scan to be used for planning. You'll see in the in the detailed report a lot of information that I think you've, you're familiar with around ATEP have, have occurred. So I won't go into too much detail, but the site plan and components for the timeline were developed. We're also looking at an environmental scan, and that will be the focus for this next year, where we'll look at assessing um, a gap analysis on, on information that we need for planning. So that will occur. So those, in a nutshell, are the six goals um, and what we've accomplished over this last year. Um, on behalf of my, the Chancellor and myself, we'd like to thank the District-wide um, Planning Council for the leadership and the work um, in, in our first year of implementation. Thank you. Very much. And we'll move now to our um, next discussion item, and that is an update on our accreditation reports. We'll start with Saddleback College first on the uh, list, and President Burnett will present that, followed by IBC President Glenn Rockmore. Madam President, trustees, uh, thrilled today to report to you, and we've submitted to each of you our accreditation follow-up report for 2012. Um, as you know, this is, uh, is a draft copy as far as a final draft. We always may have a few little edits here and there that might be coming, and certainly if we hear any, any feedback from anybody in the audience, and certainly from yourselves, we will do so. Uh, what I would like to say real quickly is that uh, we are very proud of our, our college, our district, and that includes district services, IVC, and Saddleback on the tremendous collaborative effort that we've been working working together under the leadership of our Chancellor, President Glenn Brockmore, our Academic Senates, our Classified Senates, and our ASGs uh, have just been phenomenal in coming together uh, through accreditation over this last year and dealing with the district recommendations. And with that, I'm very confident, as you know, we're already, uh, we received our reaffirmation of our accreditation. This is just a follow-up just to, to see how we're doing on those last three uh, district recommendations, which, which uh, we believe went very, very well. And once again, thank you and kudos to our Chancellor, Vice Chancellors and everybody in district services that did so well with us. With that said, I would like to give a lot of credit to at Saddleback College for working on this report. First and foremost, our two uh, accreditation steering committee co-chairs are Dr. Bob Cosgrove and Dr. Don Boucher. I want to thank them for the tremendous leadership that they've given on our accreditation process at Saddleback and once again working very well with IVC and with district services. And then finally, we'd like to introduce uh, the, uh, the writer, our main writer in our campus for this report who did an outstanding job, and that's Professor Claire Cesario Silva. 
And with that, any questions from the board on this draft follow-up report? All right, I see none at this time, so we'll move to the IVC report. Thank you very much, everyone. I would like to uh, echo what my colleague has just said. Uh, we've had a very open and collaborative uh, process, uh, particularly really the groundbreaking efforts in trying to work together uh, as a district and uh, come up with the product that we have here as a joint effort. Um, in our case, uh, Dean Kathleen Worley and Professor Lisa Davis-Allen were co-chairs uh, for this effort. Uh, Dean Worley is here tonight. We also had, uh, representing the Classified Senate, Linda Renee, and uh, our very own Thomas Thien here from ASIVC, the president, uh, worked on that as well. And uh, if you have any questions at all, I have Kathy Schmeidler, our, our current Academic Senate president, uh, is here to help with anything uh, you might want to discuss on that. All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Such an important uh, part of our operation. We appreciate both of you both of your, our college's reports. Thank you. And now our final discussion item is a report by Vice Chancellor Fitzsimmons on the actuarial study of retiree health benefit liability. While he's setting that up here, I thought I might as well proceed to the presentation. Um, as you are aware, every month we give you an OPEB liability trust fund um, report, and you see that in your report. And that's basically talking about the investment performance of the trust itself. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the liability and um, ho hopefully help you understand a very complex matter having to do with actuarial science and how meaningful it is to our actual um, uh, expenses, okay, because we fully fund this liability and have in the past. We have an actuarial study that's conducted every two years, and that is um, primarily for several purposes. And those purposes are to comply with GASB 43 and 45 standards, and we report the liability on our financial statements. Um, and it's required to do that by those st accounting standards. We also need to provide this information to district staff, um, yourselves as board of trustee members, and also just the general public so they can understand what our um, retirement health benefit liability is. And also to communicate any of the financial costs and liabilities associated with th this um, um, valuation. The study analyzes the liabilities associated with our current retirement health benefits, and that's based on our current program. We've had this uh, study done in February of 2010 last, and the valuation date of the st uh, study that you have in your packet, um, which is available in um, packet 4.0, uh, four, as well as 6.1, which talks about the funding recommendations, was done on February 1st of 2012. When the actuary performs this study, um, the, he, they look at many assumptions. And basically, this is a projected liability based on a variety of assumptions that are done by the actuary. And they're made regarding our employees' mortality rates, um, retirement tables are looked at, um, they're looking at um, expected retirement dates, they're looking at the time that will, a retiree will be using the medical benefits, how long, what the medical costs are, and all this, all this various stuff, including the claim losses, number of employees, number of retirees, are all put together in various tables and calculated to get the actual liability valuation. Compared to the results that were done in the previous study two years ago, the valuation um, increased significantly. Now we normally expect this valuation to go up by what they can call the normal cost, and that's about four million dollars per year, so we would have expected it to be about eight million dollars. And it went up by fifteen point eight million dollars, which is over the amount of planned assets. On this table, you can see that the projected liability is, is close to $85 million, and our plan assets are projected at 69, with a difference of the 15.8. Of that $85 million, 
um, just so you can get an understanding, by employee group, about 72% 72 72 of that is for faculty-related liability costs. 8% um, are for uh, classified, and about 20% are classified managers and administrators, just to give you an idea of the makeup of that. Um, the results in this larger-than-expected increase in annual required contribution is around 39.4% because it's compounded. If you try to peel away some of the components that created this liability variation, it's very hard to do because it's compounded with each other. They all impact each other and are related. Historically, as I said, we've normally paid, we've um, provided payment for the normal costs. And so um, what the actuary has explained, if the actuary experience followed the assumptions we've used in the past, with the AAL, which is the, the actual AAL and the planned assets would increase in a predictable way with each other. And in this particular case, that did not. The district would pay only the normal cost increase, and this didn't occur because it went beyond the plan assets. You're probably wondering why did this happen and how did it happen? Why did the library increase higher than plan assets? There were several reasons for this. Um, there were more retirees this time around when this study was done. As you rec recall, we just ha entered into a faculty early retirement center plan. And normally each year we have about six to eight retirements. And with 52 retirees for faculty, um, that was a huge spike. And so we added to our population being studied plus 52 because we replaced, we plan to replace all those faculty members, okay? So that added to this variation. But it wouldn't be just that in and of itself. There are several other factors. Um, there are increases in the number of employees that we hired, and that's our future retirees. So that's part of it. We also had retirement medical premium rates that increased faster than what was assumed and are also our actuary losses. Our medical rates, uh, the assumption by the actuary was about 4% each year for a total of about 8%. And our rates increased about 11.8%, almost 12%. So that was also very much higher. And then our actuary losses were about 3% of that. Um, that means the claims that were um, by the medical, uh, medical claims by the retirees were higher in cost. So those are considered our actuary losses. And then another contributing factor that was unpredicted by the actuary when he conducted the study was the PERS and STRS tables. Um, it, the actuarial uh, studies tend to use the statewide tables for predicting mortality rates, turnover rates, and um, time that um, the age at which a retiree would retire. So um, they use statewide tables, and some of these tables haven't been updated for over 10 years. And um, when they were updated by persons stirs, and they're using a variety of their own assumptions to do these updates, and they're doing mortality tables and all these different tables for each one of us um, that are going to be in the system. So we each have our own mortality table, our own retirement table, et cetera, and it's all compiled to produce the study. Um, so I wouldn't want to take a look at my own mortality table or whatever, but that's, how th that's what they do. Um, what you're finding is statewide, people are retiring early, or than normal, than was 10 years ago in some of these tables when they're updated last, and also people are living longer. So as you can imagine, when you're talking about retiree medical benefits, that they're um, entering the system using the retirement med medical benefits sooner, their cost, the cost of those benefits have increased, and also they're um, living longer, so they're using the benefits longer. So all this has compiled to create this valuation increase. So what do we do as far as next steps? Uh, we're going to be taking several next steps. So um, some of them is we know that we have a CSEA early retirement L um, incentive plan being considered. We're not going to know the actual enrollees who are signed up for this program till the beginning of October. So once we have the actual names of those enrollees, what we're going to ask the actuary to do is supplement the study that was just done, update the study so we can get an idea of what that program cost will be. Um, another thing that we're going to do is conduct an experience study to determine whether the CalPERS and those CalSTRS tables that the actuary used can be validated. Because our sense is that here in our district, our, retire, our, our faculty retire much later than we think than the state averages. So we want to do some experience studies over the last four to five years, do some history, and get a better understanding whether those tables can be validated by our own faculty and our employees' experience. 
We also want to conduct the actual study earlier in the year. Um, as you know, the study was done in February. We didn't have the information completed through a, uh, a report by the actuary until the summer, and it was already after the budget development process. So we're going to be asking that the study be done with an experienced date of um, an actuarial date of around December, so we have the information in the spring in enough time to have this information for budget development for tentative budget. In addition, we want to have it done annually for a while, because even just with a two-year change, that two years isn't very much, we still had this huge variation. So we want to have a confidence in the study, in the numbers, and have those numbers earlier so we have some time to take some steps and determine budget and funding implications. Uh, the other thing is, once they're completed, we want to have the RBOA board take a look at those, analyze those, and bring it bring it back to the Board of Trustees here so we can discuss that and talk about future steps. Funding the liability. Um, the district and the board's philosophy in the past has been to fully fund the liability. And we are a very fiscally conservative district, and this has been our philosophy, which I support. So we took a look at several funding options for the district and the board to consider, and we analyzed those to determine, since it's after a budget um, commitments have been made, what can we do now since we have this information in our hands? We went over and we had five recommendations that we looked at, five options that we looked at. And we're recommending one of them, but there are actually some options that we also can consider or some variation of them, so we wanted to present this to the board for your consideration. The recommended option was to immediately fund $9.7 million from the year one portion of the reserve for unrealized property taxes. If you take a look at item 6.1 in your packet, there's an exhibit there under um, Exhibit A. And the, the exhibit shows property tax revenues, and it shows the basic aid funding allocation and how, I don't know if you recall, when we did the basic aid presentation for you in May, and we also, and you approved those projects, and we funded those in the ton of in final budget, we had a very significant basic aid reserve, okay? Now remember, we hadn't um, funded or allocated money for basic aid projects for two years because we basically froze last year because we wanted to wait till we had the BP and AR done for basic aid allocation. So we actually have over $17 million in a basic aid reserve. Now, technically, if we're only doing one year of funding for basic aid, it'd only be one, one year's worth, but we really were conservative and did 20% for the total available. Now, the idea that reserve was intended to be for unrealized property taxes, but in essence, we're funded for two years, and we already received one whole year's worth of property taxes. So they are realized. So that $9.7 million is really the amount that's already been realized last year. Okay? And then what we wanted to do was wait until we had those um, experience study and the information from CSA to validate the number and see what the actual liability projected liability is be after it's reaffirmed by the actuary, and then fund the remainder before the end of this fiscal year, before it's recorded on the books and going into next year. So we would actually are recommending that we fully fund these, this liability. Now some of the other options, well, I should probably talk about why this is being recommended. Um, it's, it's, it's honoring the district and the budget philosophy of the board, and that is to be conservative and fund this liability. It's partially funding the liability now, but waiting for the remainder to be confirmed through the further study. This is more conservative as far as the recommendation. And that way we have a time um, whenever we get the results from the supplemental actuary report to discuss the results both at the RBOA board and at your board. And then once fully funded, we would have to um, replenish the basic aid fund for next year's basic aid cycle. But we'd be able to do that in the spring for the, in time for the tentative budget next year. Some of the other options, though, that we did consider, so we can go, go through those to see if this is the recommended option for you, and that is we looked at waiting until next budget cycle to fully fund the liability, but we hated to have a full liability recorded on the books for one more year. Option three was to plan for funding the liability over a longer period of time. And we did do that. When we initially um, put money into the OPEB trust, we did that over a time period. 
Um, this would do that again over three to five year period possibly, but then um, we would have a liability on our books which would gradually go down until it's fully funded. Option four was do not fund the unfunded portion of retirement health benefit liability. We didn't recommend that because this was against the budget philosophy of the district and the board. Some districts do do that, and um, but it does it is detrimental to our credit rating, for one thing, and it, it's it's against our um, budget philosophy. And in option five, allocate the amount needed at the end of the fiscal year if the basic aid reserve is not needed this year. So that would be waiting and not funding that initial half payment, say, of $9.7 million, but wait to do it towards the end of the fiscal year, which is also a viable option. Or any combination of these options might also be something to consider. So that's the end of my report, and I thought we might want to take a minute to look at item 6.1. And well, I'm going to, uh, excuse me just a minute, uh, I'm going to advance 6.1 before we go to the consent calendar, so I think it's timely that we do that now. It just makes sense because it relates to everything you've just said. Right. So with that, we'll advance item 6.1, and are you going to present that for us, I assume? Yes. Okay. So we're now at 6.1. We'll go back to the consent calendar after we finish 6.1. And this is, like I said, a very complicated subject. So if you have any questions, pl please feel free to ask me. I tried to make it as user-friendly as as brief a presentation as I can, but this is very complicated subject matter. Um, item 6.1 is basically making a recommendation to immediately fund $9,746,637 of the $15,820,942 of projected liability from the year one portion of the reserve for unrealized property taxes, which is shown in Exhibit A. It also is recommending that we do the experience study and also do a supplemental CSEA um, once we have the CSEA enrollees and bring it back to the board and validate the number of which then we can have a discussion with the intention of fully funding it prior to the end of the fiscal year. Okay, and if you could just summarize that the recommended action is to do option number one, and could you read option number one? Yes. Because that's what we'll be voting on. Option number one, immediately fund $9,746,637 of the $15,820,942 total unfunded liability from the year one portion of the Reserve for Unrealized Property Taxes since these property taxes were realized last year. Fund the remainder of the liability before the end of this fiscal year after the total liability amount is confirmed from further study using the second year portion of the reserve fund realized property taxes. The amount of the total liability will be confirmed through the supplemental actuary study for CSEA early retirement plan and the final results of the Sperian study. This is honoring the budget philosophy of the district and the board. It partially funds the liability now but delays fully funding the liability amount until the results of the additional study are known. This is more conservative and a discussion of the results can be presented to the board when they are available and further discussion can take place before the remaining balance of the liability is funded. Once it is fully funded this fiscal year, it will mean that the annual reserve will need to be refreshed prior to the basic aid projects being considered for next year's basic aid cycle as per um, for fiscal year 2013-2014. Okay, Trustee Pendergast has a question. So just to clarify, the $9.7 million was set aside in case the property taxes did not come in as high as we projected those pro property taxes came in. So this money is not designated presently for any purpose other than potential future building projects, which up to this point I believe we've already got funded anyway. Yes, okay. that is correct. And just also to be clear, there is also an additional 7.892451 that's right under the pink line on Exhibit A that is projected to be realized for this year as well. We're not recommending we use that until we confirm with the experience study in the CSCA, but prior to the end of the year. Okay, and we have several trustees wishing to speak, but yes. just let me clarify that the second part of option number one is really not voting on anything. You're just saying let's wait and see. 
So until that's we a, validate the number. Right. That's yes. that's like mm-hmm. vague. We're going to take action later on. We're really taking action right now on the first paragraph of Correct. option one. Trustee Lang had his button pushed before you were. So do we need a motion before we discuss? We we should have a motion, but um, I don't have anyone wishing to make a motion. Thank you. Um, I guess the what I don't under uh, I, I guess I, I am certainly completely uh, in favor of fully funding this liability before the end of the fiscal year. Um, if we have a concern about the uh, validity of the difference from the current actuarial study that's been made, I guess I don't understand why we don't just confirm what the actual number is and basically pass a motion that says we're going to fund that number. We can do that. I mean, it's just a matter of whether you wanted to fund it all now, you wanted to wait for that um, supplemental study. In that case, that's the motion I'd like to make. Would you please state your motion? Yes. My motion is to uh, validate the findings of the uh, actuarial study uh, to determine what the difference is um, in terms of our benefit liability and that amount be basically um, fully funded uh, once that uh, study is completed. Okay, right, um, it, it's that's we have a second to that motion from Trustee J. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Um, it we're not talking about hard figures. That's the problem I have with this. So I am uncomfortable voting for something that isn't a specific. Okay. Figure. Well, let, let me uh, maybe I can further explain why I feel that's a reasonable um, way to proceed. Uh, it seems to me there's some concern from the district that the number that we've been provided is too high. It's apparent that we've got money in that reserve um, that's going to exceed, that hasn't been designated for other basic aid purposes, uh, that's going to exceed certainly this number and presumably a smaller number if that's what the new study would validate. Therefore, it seems to me that that, this is a a perfectly reasonable um, path to take. Trustee Pendergast. Uh, Just to clarify, are you then basically option five? Is that what I'm hearing? If the reserve or unrealized property tax is not required for other items this fiscal year, allocate the amount needed to fully fund the liability before the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. Essentially, that's right. Option five. Okay. So... All right, so we're going to, that's essentially what you're stating, is option five. Any other comments, questions? Okay, so I understand we're going to vote for option five. And everyone vote, please, or, uh, there we go. Just email that. All right, carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We'll now go back to the consent calendar, and I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Or does anyone want to pull item from the consent calendar? Uh, wait just a minute. Let me hear if anyone wants to pull an item. Trustee Pendergast. Uh, 5.5, please. 5.5 is pulled off the consent calendar, and Trustee Jay has moved the balance of the consent calendar. And I'll second. Second by Trustee Lang. Let's vote on the balance of the consent calendar. Trustee Wright. All right, carries unanimously. 5.5. Trustee Pendergast. Yeah, I just wanted to, to – so this is the, the former – at library, we're designating it now as a learning resource center since it's kind of changed its role, um, and I'm just making sure that that's what that that's what we're doing here. Uh, that's my understanding. We can h- hear it's we. The library uh, and oh, okay. Let, let's just wait till we push the button. Trustee Wright. It's, it looks like it's the library and learning resources. Okay, so it would be called the Library and Learning Resource Center. Um, And let me just weigh in. I I would prefer that we would um, name this the Library and or the Learning Center and Library, however you want to say it, and uh, in memory of um, uh, Dr. McCullough, who was so important to our school. I'm not sure if we would need to re-agendize this, but that's what I would like to change it to. Trustee Lang. Yes, I would certainly, I mean, I think that is um, a notion worth considering, but 
seems to me that this might be a good interim step if that makes sense. We can always turn around and um, uh, add to this Richard McCulloch uh, Library and Learning Resource Center, uh, but I, I, I think I'd, I'd probably want uh, maybe to further consider that, and maybe that means we um, uh, might table the, the whole um, item for now, um, but um, I'd probably be in favor of that. Okay. Are you making a motion to table it and have it brought back um, at the next meeting? I'll wait until uh, everybody has had a chance to. Okay. Any other comments? Ahead. Trustees? Trustee Wright. The one thing is that the sign is already up. As you walk in, it says Library and Learning Resource Center. Well, that's its function. And before its function was primarily library, but it was a learning resource center. We just didn't acknowledge that on the sign. So any other comments? No? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, we have her shared governance wishing to speak, Bob Cosgrove. Go ahead. There has been some discussion uh, about naming another building after Rich, but uh -huh. I don't have the details of it, so that's maybe I off see. in the wings, too. Okay. Trustee Printergast. Uh It sounds like uh, we could go ahead and vote on it like this, and as Trustee Lang had said, we can always later we can bring it back and add that designation to it and, you know, let Classified Senate and, and uh, um, everyone look at it. The academic Senate look, look at it because I know they had come forth with a recommendation similar to before and maybe now they're looking at something else. Give them an opportunity to weigh into that and then we can always change it later. Are so I would, I would make a motion then to go ahead and accept 5.5 .5 as written. I second it. All right. Second by Trustee um, Milchaker. Let's vote on the item. Any other comments before we vote? Let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously. So we are now at 6.2. And this is an item for approval, and it is on policies and administrative regulations that are reviewed and updated. So any, I move by Trustee Lang, second by Trustee Wright. Any comments or questions on any of these? All right, let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously. 6.3. This is a request to rescind spring 2013 sabbatical for Lisa Davis Allen. Moved by Trustee Jay, second by Trustee Lang. Questions or comments? Seeing none, let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously. 6.4, Faculty Association Academic uh, Employee Memorandum of Understanding, and I believe uh, our negotiator, David Lang, I'm sorry, David Bouquet will present this item. <laughs> well, you're both David. <laughs> On this item, uh, the faculty association and the district, they agreed that we would continue a dialogue throughout the year and update the contract as needed. What you see here is evidence of that agreement. Um, we've come together. We've uh, addressed all three issues, and we feel comfortable working with the faculty association that these are the interest of our faculty members as well as the district. So we recommend that the board approve this item and also authorize the uh, my, myself to sign on behalf of the, the, the district uh, agreement with the faculty association. So, so it's been moved by Trustee Pinner, yes, seconded by Trustee Jay. Seeing no other Comments, all right, let's vote on the item. <coughs> Trustee Melchicker. I did vote for There you go. Carries unanimously, thank you. 6.5, this is uh, academic personnel actions, and this is, again, no changes. All right, so I entertain a motion to approve this item. Move approval. Trustee Melchicker, no, second by Trustee Meldale. Let's vote on the item, no comments. Trustee Melchicker. <laughs> All right, carries unanimously. Not too soon. All right, six point six. This is for classified personnel actions for approval. So I move approval. We have one minor change. We on have one change. Go ahead. On page four, item C one one B. Like to add the uh, division of math, science, and engineering to that. C one one B, and it's. What is the change? The, the, add the words division, math, science, and engineering. Okay. To that after astronomy. Okay. Second. 
Okay. It's who moved the item? Uh, Trustee yeah. Milchiker and Trustee Jay seconded. Okay. All right. No comments? So, all right. Let's vote on the item with the change. Student trustee, thank you. Carries unanimously. We are now at 6.7, and that is the POA um, master agreement. And again, our negotiator, Vice Chancellor Begay. In, in this case, the, uh, the uh, POA, Police Officers Association District, have come together, recommend ratification of the agreement as attached. Okay. Questions or comments from board members? So moved. So moved by Trustee. Um, Trustee Meldown, seconded by Trustee Printer. Yes, let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously. Very good. We are now at 6.8, and this is the dental benefits for unrepresented SOCCCD employees. I move approval on this. And this will be presented by Vice Chancellor Bouguet. We'd like to uh, provide the same dental benefits as we have with the other bargaining groups with, within the district for the unrepresented employees. Okay. Any, who moved it? I'm sorry. I'm Trustee Milchicker and, and seconded by Trustee J. All right. Seeing no comments or questions, let's vote on the item. Carries unanimously. Wonderful. We're now at 7.1, and this is our um, report. So it's essentially. 6.9. I'm sorry. 6.9? I missed that. Okay. 6.9. I'll move approval on this. Okay. Who's going to present this item? The Irvine Valley College Life Science Takeover Agreement. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. President Rockmore? Um, basically, oh, what I'm you sorry. have is in front of you a takeover agreement because the contractor for the IBC Life Science Building went into surety and couldn't complete the project. Right. This agreement is a draft agreement uh, in which we're going to be um, substituting a new contractor, S.J. Amoroso, and it's giving... Um, uh, approval for us to um, execute and negotiate w within consultation with legal counsel the final agreement under the, on, on approximately the same terms as the previous agreement for the project so it can be completed in a timely manner, which is projected for April 2013. Okay. So moved. Trustee J moved and tr Trustee Pendergast seconded it. <laughs> Trustee Lang had a question. Yes, just uh, real quickly, um, I have no problem at all in approving the uh, chancellor um, finishing this, making it a final agreement. Uh, I would like that, though, to come back to the board once um, uh, signed with uh, full exhibits, including B and C. Okay. Are you asking that that happen before we approve it? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. All right, so this is a report. That, yes. Okay, very good. Any other comments or questions? All right, let's vote on the motion. Okay, motion carries unanimously. And now we are at 7.1. This is the Teacher of the Year Recognition Ceremony. Anyone want to comment about that? Okay, Chancellor, it's your item. No? Okay, any questions? No? We'll move to 7.2, and that's Proposition 30. We are going to have Executive Director of Fiscal Services, Kim McCord, give a very brief presentation on Prop 30. Okay, thank you very much. Please introduce yourself for the audience. Hi, I'm Kim McCord, the Executive Director of Fiscal Services here at the district, and I am going to do a short overview of Prop 30 for you. Find the presentation. Okay, well, I'm going to go over again briefly um, Proposition 30 and the effect on community colleges as well as our district. Of course, this initiative was put on the ballot by the governor to partially address the state deficit problem that we've been having. It's important to note that the $6 billion that this should bring in this year has already been included in the state budget, even though the election isn't till November. Um, so there's consequences whether it passes or not. 
Uh, first of all, the budget reductions over the last several years um, have had really a tremendous impact on the community college system. The overall state funding for community colleges has been cut by $809 million since 2008-2009, um, which is a 12% reduction in funding. Um, this has forced the colleges to reduce court sections um, offered by about 24% statewide. The result is almost 500,000 fewer enrollments for students, about 17%. We have increased class sizes and long waiting lists for all of our classes. Um, Proposition 30 consists of two temporary tax changes. The first one is a one quarter percent increase in the sales tax for the next four years. So that'll take it from 7.25% up to 7.5%. The second item increases the personal income tax rates for the next seven years on filers making more than 250,000 or 500,000 for joint filers. Um, the rate increase is 1% for taxable income between 250,000 and 300,000 which is the current rate for filers making over a million. So you can see they're dropping that cap down. So instead of 9.3%, it's actually going to be 10.3. And then the other increases are 2% for income between 300000 and 500000 and 3% more for income over 500000 So those are significant increases to those taxpayers. All right, if Prop 30 passes, the impact on community colleges is actually marginal. Um, it'll increase the Prop 98 funding guarantee for K-14 education by $2.9 billion, which will be funded out of the new taxes. Of that amount, $210 million will be coming to community college system. The first $160 million will be reducing the inner year um, apportionment deferrals that currently total about $1 billion, um, which is about 30% of the apportionment funds that the colleges receive. So these deferrals cause significant cash flow issues for the colleges that receive state apportionment. And any reduction in that is really helpful for their operations. The other $50 million will be used to fund 1% growth or um, restoration in enrollment and will help with the workload reductions that we've had in the past years. And the other impact is for fiscal years 13, 14 through 15, 16. They estimate about a 4% increase in funding for community colleges, which is significant compared to what we've had in the last few years. Now, if the proposition fails, of course, there won't be any funds to buy down those deferrals, and there will be no funds for enrollment growth or restoration. Um, in addition, the colleges will face a mid-year base revenue cut of $339 million, which is about 7.5%. This will be implemented, again, as a workload reduction, so colleges will be faced with cutting course sections for their students. And you have to think 7.5% over a year, if we don't know until November, that's really cutting 15% out of spring which is a huge impact, and most of the colleges probably won't be able to react that quickly. Um, it's also important to note that the K-12 districts have been hurt tremendously by this. Some of our local districts have taken big cuts in the last few years. Saddleback Valley Unified has cut over $50 million in recent years, and Capistrano Unified has cut over $150 million. So additional cuts are going to tremendously impact those programs. Now, how does this impact our district? Um, if the measure passes, we will have that 1% available for enrollment growth, which I think our colleges are prepared to achieve and will appreciate those extra funds to add course sections and provide student services. Um, sorry. Um, however, if the measure fails, we would not have those growth funds available. But unlike districts um, that receive state apportionment, we wouldn't be faced with those mid-year cuts. We would not have to cut any course sections. Um, if we weren't a basic aid district, we would be facing about $9. million worth of budget cuts um, and have to cut a tremendous number of sections. It's unknown really at this time if there'll be some other effects on us because of the, um, the budget cuts. That we could lose categorical money. We just don't know. There's just, it's such a big, um, a big cut that we just don't know what other things could roll into it. So well, that's it for the presentation. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, Trustee Lang has a question. Oh, I don't. I'm sorry. My... Oh, no, you don't. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Trustee Pendergast. Yeah, I just, you know, it hits me doubly because I teach in Tustin Unified, and we already know that the, the base revenue limit would be reduced $457 per student with 24,000 students, about $10.9 $10 million in mid-year cuts. And, you know, so this this is a very, it's very important that, that it be looked at rationally as to, unfortunately, we're, we're stuck with this situation where the government is holding this kind of gun to our heads of, of if you don't pass this, these cuts are going to come. 
but but it is what it is and and unfortunately we're we're being put in that position but i i think it's important to note for those that aren't aware there is another tax initiative on there and the difference between the primary difference between the two is the other one is only for k through 12 and it doesn't deal with prop 98 deferrals and funding so this is probably the more important of the two for for the community college aspect but possibly for for all around so yeah i just it's it's not good news but it could be worse if it doesn't pass any other comments or questions all right thank you very much okay we are now at 7.3 and that's Saddleback College, Urban Valley College, reassigned time and stipends. Any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to 7.4. That's the report of speakers for both Saddleback and Irvine Valley. Comments or questions? Seeing none, 7.5 is the basic aid report. There are no changes since the August report. Okay. Seeing no comments or questions, we'll move to 7.6, and that's the facility plan status report. No comments or questions on that one. 7.7, .7, the monthly financial status report. And again, moving on to 7.8, retiree trust fund. Okay. 7.9, AB 540 pension reform. Okay, moving right on. We are now at item eight, and that's our uh, reports from our constituent groups. We'll start with Saddleback. Sorry, 7.1? 7.10. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, mandated costs. This is an informational item for the board. Um, as you may already be aware, that we do um, cl claims reimbursement to the state of California for all of our mandated costs. Um, we pay a consultant to help us with those claims. They're very, very difficult to do. And we have an option this year to um, take advantage of a mandated cost block grant um, instead of doing those claims reimbursements, of which we haven't been getting funded for in the past for over almost close to $7 million is owed to us from the state of California. And they haven't put money in the budget for claims reimbursement, but they have put money in the budget for the mandated cost block grant. We did an analysis and we could get additional monies to the district for about $800,000 a year versus about what we've been averaging when we did get claims reimbursement about $200,000 a year. So we did recommend and we did submit to the state chancellor's office that we would um, select this other option for this particular year. And does that take any action? We, it's, it's not, not action, it's informational, and it's not in the budget, so that will be new revenues coming to the um, two colleges okay. for this. Seeing no comments or questions, we'll move now to the um, reports from our uh, other groups. So Bob Cosgro from Saddleback College Academic Senate. Thank you, President. Um, just two things. Um, you've heard the first set of uh, presentations on student completion uh, this evening, and I hope that you found them useful. Uh, if there are any suggestions you have about um, the way the information is being presented to you, because some of this material is familiar to us, but it may not be quite familiar to you in terms of definitions, uh, please let uh, Kathy or me know, and we'll, we'll try to get the information to you and make it as clear as possible. Uh, secondly, um, out of that report, uh, we're, we're hearing reports that uh, some of the schools around us are now having 45 students in English classes, and that's spreading uh, the effect of the teacher so thin that even bright students are going to be suffering because they're not going to get the kind of instruction that's necessary. So that puts an additional burden on not just Saddleback and Irvine Valley, but all the community colleges and colleges. Uh, and it makes uh, students' uh, life a much more of a struggle than it would have to be. I hope these uh, uh, the re one resolution uh, passes and money is coming forth with. Thank you. Okay. And our faculty association president, Paula Jacobs. 
Thank you. Uh, two comments. The first one uh, has to do with the tragic passing of our colleague Daryl Dieter. Uh, we're in the faculty association. We're especially saddened by this because Daryl was a member of our representative council and he will be missed. Secondly, I would like to comment. I am wearing my yes on Prop 30 button. Uh, I would like to comment. Um, it was an excellent report that Kim made. Um, Personally, I don't want to see my taxes go up any more than anyone else uh, wants to. Um, but I do want to have an educated citizenry, and I do want to have adequate public safety services available when I need them. And as Trustee Prendergast said, the situation is what it is. And a Prop 30 does look like the most viable option to um, address the situation. Uh, as a basic aid district, we uh, might be somewhat insulated from the massive cuts, but I think eventually those cuts will find their way to our doorstep, and they will affect our students. As an example, students trying to transfer to the CSU will experience a 5% tuition hike beginning spring 2013. Admissions notifications to the CSU will be delayed and GPA admissions requirements are likely to be raised. So we're putting all of this effort into student success, but if Prop 30 doesn't pass, our students may not be able to realize their educational goals. I would encourage the board to consider adopting a resolution supporting Prop 30. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our uh, Irvine Valley College Academic Senate President, Kathy Smidler. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo what Paula just said and remind everyone here, including the board, of course, that uh, even though we may feel as though we are protected somewhat because we're a basic aid district, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to use the normal f fright tactic that we might not always be basic aid, but something much more direct, and that is what happens in the surrounding communities affects us directly when students can't go to those colleges they just continue to flow in here, which would be fine if we were allowed to grow, but we're not. And so really all it is is piling more students banging, banging at our doors that we can't handle than we already have. So we are affected now as well as in some in indeterminate future. Um, I'd like to bring to the board's attention how much cooperation there is between the two colleges. It's, uh, it's really been quite wonderful cooperation between the two senates um, and even between the senates and the and the association sometimes. <laughs> it happened. Wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> quite amazing. Quite amazing. Quite yeah. amazing. And um, under the aegis of the chancellor among the not just the faculty but the faculty the variety of levels of staff and administrators of the coll both colleges and district services coming together in a number of different fora to work on <clears throat> common and district common issues and district wide issues and i've been very impressed over the course of these past few months about uh, on how much work is being done and how cooperative and collegial everybody is it's not to say that there aren't differences and, dis and uh, differences of opinion and differences of point of view, but people are willing to work them out. Um, members of our Senate and our faculty uh, are participating in all levels of committee work at their, in their own disciplines all the way through district-wide. And, um, and I think it's, it's a very healthy attitude that we can see here at the district. And that's reflected, of course, in these accreditation midterm or follow-up reports, rather. And I Wonderful. think if you, when you read them, that's going to be the theme. Wonderful. Thank that's you. Very good to hear. All right, Vice, uh, sorry, President Glenn Rockmore, Irvine Valley College. Oh, I just got demoted. No, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> there was one person in between you that no, had no. a in front of you, and he's not here tonight. Right, that's right. what happened. <laughs> uh, well, first off, I would uh, like to thank President Pat Padberg for her thoughtful comments at our 9-11 event. It was very deeply appreciated. Uh, and also thanks to uh, Trustee Lang, Wright, and Prendergast uh, for attending, as well as our Chancellor, uh, Gary Portner. 
Um, following on, on the theme of our Academic Senate President, um, you know, I would like to thank our team that presented on the Student Success Task Force Recommendation 1 and just highlight the collaboration and how much better our work is when we work together with our sister college. And uh, that's deeply appreciated. And also that is reflected in our accreditation report as well, uh, working together like we never have before. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody on October 13th, we have our Veterans Angels um, uh, Gala, and this is an effort to raise funds that are particularly targeted toward helping our veterans fill the financial gap that they run into, uh, frankly, with the Veterans Administration and, and trying to get uh, their college goals completed. So I hope you'll be able to uh, make it to that. And then finally, uh, uh, I'm hearing about a homecoming here, and I would like to wish Saddleback College uh, a great success and a, and a big win on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Got it. President uh, Burnett from Saddleback we College. We might need that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, first I want to give a little bit of echo and, and ditto on the successes of our faculty and our our colleges of uh, collaboration working together. You know, I was up there listening to uh, three of our fine faculty members in our district, uh, one from IVC and one, two from, from Saddleback, and uh, was just reminded that uh, I wish we could have every meeting and we could have the presentations made on the things that our faculty are doing. It is unbelievable. Uh, you think we have a 1,000 faculty in this district. We'll multiply what you saw times a 1,000. All right, maybe by 350 if you, for those math majors. Uh, and, uh, and that's what you'd get. So uh, we're very proud. Uh, and every day, even myself, I'm learning new things uh, about what our faculty are doing out there. And frankly, that's our job about student success, really, is to allow our faculty uh, and our instruction, our training and education programs to flourish. And, and that's how it happens. And this is the results that you see. So thank you to our academic senates and uh, to our, uh, and I'm really pleased to, to have you see a lot of these um, efforts coming forward in the future. With that said, um, I just want to say again, uh, Saddleback College is extremely grieved uh, by the loss of two um, special people for our college. First, of course, Professor Daryl Dieter. Uh, Daryl was truly uh, a wonderful person, um, and uh, I personally am extremely uh, grieved and sad of his, uh, of his passing way too early uh, and suddenly, and uh, we will miss him greatly. He was a wonderful addition for our students, for our automotive technology program, and for our college, so, um, and for, frankly, for our community. Um, second, uh, we were very sad to uh, have lost one of our students, and it makes it even more sad that this is one of our veteran students uh, uh, who passed away this uh, tragically this last month. Uh, Adam Razani uh, was an Air Force, uh, Dr. Wright, an Air Force veteran who served in Afghanistan. Uh, he was a Aliso Nigel High School graduate and uh, attended Saddleback before his service, and then after the service came back, and unfortunately, um, probably greatly due to his service, uh, was not able to, um, it really had a tragedy befall him. So we, we look, our, our hearts got to both their families and friends. Finally, on a, on a good positive note, this is the time for events. As you all know, uh, this uh, we have our transfer day college fair. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, on Thursday of this week, which we're very excited about since that is one of our top priorities. Um, as you all heard, homecoming the 29th. Thank you for those trustees that are able to make it, and hopefully we do have a win. Uh, October 11th is our annual State of the College Community Breakfast. Uh, on the, f the 19th, I should uh, remind everybody that uh, speaking of our collaboration and cooperation, IVC and Saddleback are both uh, hosting a Student Success Summit. Uh, it will be the first one done uh, here at Saddleback on the October 19th. And you'll get more information about that, but I encourage you to come. And that's a college-wide, for both our college district-wide uh, uh, summit session to talk about various issues. And I believe they're focusing on basic skills, Bob. Is that correct? Do you know at the summit? I'm not sure. Anyway, they have a very nice agenda. We're hoping to we have a speaker who's, whose main interest is bas basic skills, but I believe we're, going, we're trying to find another speaker who will expand the... Uh, the design a little bit to general student success. Terrific, terrific. <clears throat> Luncheon as well. So, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, just so you know, we had the accreditation uh, presentations to you. Our actual the visiting teams is coming to both our colleges and our district on uh, November 9th. We look forward to uh, having them come and be successful. Thank you. Okay, and our vice chancellor of technology, Bob Bermucci. No report this evening. Okay, our vice chancellor of human services, David Bouquet. I want to thank the board for attending the tour today. We hold no animosity towards Dr. Bermucci or his department for incurring the favor of the board of the tour. <laughs> a certain Deborah probably concurs the same. 
<laughs> but he's buying lunch this week. <laughs> A little competition. It's never hurt anyone. And Vice Chancellor of Fiscal Services. I uh, just wanted to point out that um, last year, at the end of the fiscal year, we had provided authorization, recommendation to the board for OCDE to um, do the end of the year cleanup transfers. And um, that was when I first got here, and um, we took a look at our practices. We like to do best practice. We institute doing those monthly transfers and amendments and submitting them to OCDE on a monthly basis. So this year, we didn't have to do any, even though we asked for authorization, they didn't have to do any cleanup transfers because they were all per perfect that we had submitted throughout the year. So we wanted to congratulate fiscal services for that. So we don't anticipate having to do that in the future years as well, and I think Trustee Lang would re greatly appreciate this one. Thank you. We also wanted to point out that we did have our annual 311 report submitted to the state. The 50% uh, law calculation is always something that I think is very, of great interest to the uh, college community as well as to the board. The calculation was 51.71%. We, we anticipated that this would go decrease due to the uh, early retirement incentive plan and a loss of 52 faculty, and it did. But we monitored that on a monthly basis, provided the information both to the chancellor and to the draft committee of, and that's something that we're going to provide as a standard report. We anticipate that to go up because we have um, now hired a significant amount of replacement faculty. So we just wanted to share that number with the, to the board. Thank you. And our Irvine Valley College uh, Classified Senate President, Dennis Gordon. Thank you. Uh, on Friday, uh, the 28th, our Classified Senate uh, will once again be assisting the distribution of food and other necessities for our veterans and their families. Uh, we'll also be in including uh, EOPS uh, family members of the college. Uh, last year we distributed about uh, uh, food to about 40 families. This year we anticipate between 50 and 60 families will be able to participate in that. And then on Thursday I've been invited to attend Orange Coast College's uh, district-wide uh, combined classified Senate meeting. Um, I'm the uh, Southwest Regional Representative for the State uh, Association for CS. And I've been asked to uh, go to the meeting and share my insight into what's happening with classified senates around the state. So I'll be doing that on Thursday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our Saddleback College classified senate president, Don Minio. Thank you. And um, just because the, the union wasn't able to show up today, but um, there was a couple of things for their next meeting. Um, they're going to be appointing a new vice president because the first vice president actually took Jan Mastrangelo's pace. Okay. Um, and then they're going to do new elections in October and November for the people that will be starting in January. So unlike any other group here, they kind of start in January. <laughs> um, as Kathy said down there at the end of the table, that this area is getting much, much healthier. And the Classified Senate is here to inform other employees of the policies and the change of policies, and we're trying to do a good job with that. Um, of course, our employees are very busy, especially helping students. Uh, testament why the union person wasn't here today. <laughs> um, we were deeply saddened, of, of course, with uh, Dr. Daryl Dieter as well. Um, and also, uh, if I never updated you, our Macy's fundraiser, we did take in about $645, which actually we are planning to use over about half of that for a brick for John Pelalikas, who retired. Um, and actually, we're going to get three lines so we can actually mention his, his work in the war of the Battle of the Bulge. I right. said everyone's working on that Battle of the Bulge, but his was much more a tribute and the testament of, of, of Americans' uh, veterans. Um, and also, uh, looking how things are getting created in the world, I'm showing people uh, a YouTube video about a carp diem school in Arizona. Not saying it is a way for education to get done, but it's a very interesting uh, video. You can just look it up on YouTube. And it's actually in Yuma, Arizona, and how they're changing education and lowering their costs. So thank you. Thank you. Our Salvat College ASG president, Chelsea Goosen, is that right? I'm filling in for our president, Eric Brown. Oh, I'm Vice sorry. President. Thank you. Go ahead. What's your name? Chelsea Goosen. Okay. Um, we are currently <coughs> working on amending our bylaws to reflect the um, split in the counseling division so that we have accurate representation from two separate senators. And we are also creating one of our current positions. We're transforming it into a leadership position on our leadership council. 
um, where you had a club rush on the 20th, which was very successful, and we received um, applications for nominations for our two inner club council positions that are available. We only have one more Senate position and one leadership position available on our student government, so we have almost our full core, and we're excited about that. We are looking forward to the homecoming event this Saturday and our blood drive this Tuesday and Wednesday. And I believe that is all. Okay, great. And our IBC ASG president, Thomas Thin. Good evening, everyone. And we don't do any big things this month, but we did blood drive, which is everyone on campus is welcome to donate the blood to UCI Medical Hospital. And we had a really successful club day, as our trustee Park mentioned. A lot of people showed up, and we have really some new creative clubs, kind of like physics clubs. The the president of the physics clubs actually did some like experiment related to physics on campus on the club days. So that's really awesome. It really attracts a lot of students. And also on October 19th. Oh, ESIVC student government will be attending LA conference, which is a leadership conference for all California community colleges, students government, and we'll be interacting and learn more about leadership skills from each other. And also we're still working on how to get students get more involved on their campus life instead of just studying and leaving on campus. Thank you. All right. Tonight, we somberly close our meeting in honor of three members of our college community who recently passed away. As you've heard, Saddleback College Professor Daryl Dieter. Daryl was an esteemed and beloved member of our automotive technology faculty since 2005. He was known for his warmth, humor, and great kindness to students and coworkers. Saddleback College student veteran Adam Razani, student and Air Force veteran who served in Afghanistan. He attended Saddleback College prior to his military service and was enrolled again this fall. And Irvine Valley College student Michael Anthony Williams, a resident of the Village of Hope. He was working to get his life back on track, attending classes at IVC, and he was known on campus for his warmth, engaging smile, and friendly personality. We close this meeting in memory of um, their lives and, um, and their uh, uh, involvement with uh, uh, the college district. Thank you. <laughs>